Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Say it's good to see you. You can tell the A students, they're always here on time. Have the notebooks out and the textbook in their hands. Isn't it wonderful to have a Bible? Have the privilege and the freedom to read and study from a Bible? Each evening at 7 o'clock, we travel to some country that's been my privilege to visit. The travel is related to the subject matter that we study from the Bible later. But just now, I'm going to ask you, please, lean back, relax, fasten your seat belts. And we're going to be on our way this evening. We're going to go to what is said to be the most romantic city in all the world. Maybe I ought to have a little contest. Where do you think we're going to? The most romantic city in the world. Where do you think? Paris. Paris. How many of you said Paris? You thought Paris. How many of you? You're all wrong. Come on. I heard somebody say Ritzville. <laughs> all right. No, we're going to Venice. And then we'll decide in a bit if we think it's the most romantic city in all the world. I left from the city of Florence in Italy at about 5 o'clock in the morning by way of train. And I traveled a few hours to Venice, got off the train, and everything that I would do from that point on by way of conveyance or travel, other than foot travel, would be done in a boat. For this city you see is unique. It is made of the result of a confluence of rivers. In Alaska, I suppose, they might call them chain rivers, where one river runs through another and they commingle like this, you see. They intermingle together. This commingling, this confluence, has resulted in a bit over a hundred islands, most of them fair-sized, and upon these hundred islands, the city of Venice originated several hundred years ago. It was, in fact, America's foremost literist and writer of the past century, Mr. Ernest Hemingway, who, because of his love of the city, went here and spent months and ended up writing a book entitled Across the River and Into the Woods. Across the rivers, there were once dense forests, hardwood forests, oak and larch, and they cut those trees down made pilings or ties out of them, brought them back and drove them down into the mud and then built the city atop those pilings. And so tonight, we're going to be seeing a number of different kinds of boats, and perhaps I'll point some of them out to you. Here over on the left-hand side, we see a boat that is Philippine mahogany, a plank mahogany boat, and it's a fair-sized boat, and that tells us that the owner of that boat is either a fairly successful businessman or a wealthy family. It's not unlike having a Rolls-Royce Corniche down in the Hollywood area. And those boats are very, very expensive, and they're really quite rare now. And then in the center picture, we see the city bus. It's a fiberglass boat, <clears throat> and if you want to travel from one island to the next, or at any distance at all, you get aboard the city bus boat. And then over to the right-hand side, you see the boat that is called the Boat of Romance. That is the gondola. And we're going to talk much more about those in just a little bit. But now let's move in. Just today, as I was driving down Broadway Street, I saw the ambulance going with lights and siren flashing and all. And it reminded me of this picture and of this occasion. This is the ambulance in the city of Venice. And aboard that boat, they have all the measures for life support, oxygen and the defibrillators and all of the rest. And they will attempt to stabilize someone while they're rushing them to the hospital. They do it aboard a boat. But that's not all. If there is a funeral, that is the hearse, ladies and gentlemen. And someone's taken the last ride in that boat. This will give you a little bit of an idea of Main Street's sort of intersecting with lesser streets. Perhaps you have heard that the city has been sinking down into the mud. Well, that's not exactly true. While the water is getting higher and doing more and more damage to the buildings, it's really not the result of the city's sinking. Matter of fact, in the last few years, there has been an up thrust. There has been a push up against those planks and timbers that are down in the mud. And the city has been raised up just a fraction but in spite of that, there is more, more, more water, and that may sound strange, but here is the answer to the riddle. 
in order to get the bigger ships near and near to town, in order that the vegetable ships can come right into the vegetable warehouses, they have widened the canals and deepened the channel, and that, of course, lets more water come in from the sea. The sea, by the way, is the Adriatic, which is just an arm or a branch off of the Mediterranean. Consequently, the deepening of the water has ruined some of the most wonderful, some of the most famous art in all the world, and it's caused some other problems as well. Now here we see streets and alleys. You see a sidewalk there with folks walking over the top of it, and down beneath it you see a boat going through the archway there. And this also gives us a pretty fair idea of the construction. Remember, driven down into the mud are those pilings of hardwood, and then atop those are the foundation stones, big stones, and then atop those big stones there have been laid bricks. The bricks have then been covered over with plaster, and it seems to matter little whether or not you repaint, because they will repaint these buildings and make them bright and lovely and just a matter of days as a result of the destruction of the salt water and the pollution that comes from the factories. By the way, this is the center. You ladies, of course, knew this. This is the center of the most lovely lead crystal glass in all the world, Venetian glass. And something else originated there. Could you guess what it might be? Covers the windows, Venetian, that's right, Venetian blinds. So it has lots of factories, and those factories belch out pollution, and um, we're going to talk more about that as we go along as well. Now, this is the police cruiser. This last night, my officer buddy sat right over here near the front, and, and we conversed a little bit, you remember? Officer Twig, well, this is the cruiser, and they pulled someone over, and they're writing him a ticket. I don't know if he was speeding or maybe driving under the influence of something or another, but I've thought about this. It would be a little bit embarrassing to be pulled over <laughs> and written a ticket right on your front step, wouldn't it now? I bet all the neighbors are looking and laughing, huh? Boy, it's about time, huh? I'm tired of him speeding by, raising the way. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the Grand Canal. We would call it Main Street. And across this Main Street, there is a bridge called Rialto. You may want to go home and look it up and read a bit about it. It is the second oldest bridge in all the world. It was built in 1588. There is one older bridge, and we'll see that in another city, not so far away, on another evening. The Grand Canal. I have noticed that when folk come to this auditorium, whomever drives often lets out the passengers out near the entry, and then backs away or drives away to park somewhere in the parking lot. Well, this is the way it is here. This is one of the many cathedrals, and they have one for each island, you might be interested to note. And whomever drives here brings the passengers right over here, and they offload, and then he backs the boat away and parks it somewhere over here in the parking lot. In Europe, Paris and Rome, certainly in other major cities, they have their outdoor restaurants, which are lovely through the spring, summer, and fall. And folks are asked when they enter, would you prefer to dine inside or al fresco, outside? Well, here, they're not going to be outdone. They have built an addition to the front of the restaurant, a, a wharf, I guess we could say, or a dock. And they've put awnings, and they have put tables and chairs, and you're given the option to dine outdoors. I noticed this, however. If you're seated on the back side of the table, the mater d' will whisper in your ear, be careful when you push away. <laughs> not a bad idea, I'll tell you. Not a bad idea at all. Well, this is a typical home. There's the front door. Opens on to the canal, as you can see. I've thought about this. It wouldn't be a good situation if you had a problem with somnambulance. Now, if there's anyone here from Idaho, that means someone who sleepwalks. <laughs> I'm going to pick on the Idahoans a little more later uh, because, uh, because I'm laughing at myself. You know that by now, don't you? Old Idaho Lyle. By the way, down in Salem, where I worked a while back, before we were finished, they were calling me Spuds Albrecht. 
<laughs> and that's okay. But I'll tell you what, if you wandered out of that door in your sleep, you'd be in for a rude awakening by the time you hit that polluted water. But now notice up at the second level, and you'll see this lady's garden. These happen to be flowers, but I have seen in similar pots tomatoes, bell peppers, um, other kinds of garden things that you might put in a salad. Well, you see, the folks have no opportunity to go into the backyard and grow a garden. There's no backyard. And so they do the best that they're able to do, and that we are now passing by. This is parade day on the Grand Canal, and you see the boats coming. And traditionally, whether it's Fourth of July or some other occasion in our environment, the band leads the parade. And the drums beat and the horns blow and the marchers come behind them. It's not really unlike that here. In the first boat is the band. Now, when we decorate up a wagon or we decorate up something and put it in a parade, what do we call it? What do we call that? A float, exactly so. The Pasadena Rose Parade, here comes the float from the JCs. This whole idea of floats originated here in this city, in the parades. Those are the original floats, ladies and gentlemen. And the folks who live in along the Grand Canal and have apartments up above, lofts, if you please, have a really good view of the parade. Now let's talk a little bit about this boat of romance, the gondola. Originally, it was a warship. The Doge family who ruled the city-state here for decades and decades and decades kept here a large army hundreds and hundreds of sailors, and, and a large ground force as well. They had here 1,600 boats, some of them large, but the majority of them were gondolas, warships. And these are not so terribly different from the war canoes of the Native Americans who lined the Oregon, Washington, British Columbia coasts a few hundred years back, or, or even less time than that, less than 100 years in some instances. Well. Since there is no longer a great navy here, or a need for it, they have turned these boats into boats of romance. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is said in study after study that there are more folk who come to this city to be engaged, to celebrate Valentine's Day, to celebrate an anniversary, or to have their wedding performed. More folks come here in that way than any other single city on the earth. Now, I'm not sure of the accuracy of that statement, but the folks over here certainly advertise in that way. Now, as soon as I got back from this trip, someone asked me, did you take a gondola ride? And I said, no, I did not, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, I was traveling with three preachers, and I wasn't feeling particularly romantic. But secondly, and more importantly, really, while the canals in these pictures don't show it, they are terribly polluted. Now, you just think with me for a moment. Here's a city that was built hundreds of years ago, built in and on the water. Where do you suppose the sewer all originally went? If you have a leaking pipe today, where do you suppose it goes? You know where it goes. I shot this film with Kodak Kodachrome film, uh, these pictures, Kodachrome film, and Kodachrome has the effect to make reds more brilliant, blues more blue, and greens a brighter green. In spite of that, you can see that the waters here are brown, they're nasty, they're ugly, they're polluted, and they smell badly. And I could not see the romance in paying some guy a hundred bucks to paddle me through the city sewer. I just couldn't do it. But lots of folks were doing it. They were lined up in a line over a block long, paying their money, and the gondolier will take the lovers out onto the canals, and he will ask them, if they're celebrating perhaps an anniversary, what song was sung at your wedding? Or what song were they singing? What was playing on the jukebox when you first danced and fell in love? And then he will sing that song. And they know nearly all the great standards, the great love songs. And with their Italian tenor voices, they sing. And it's quite nice, really, to, to hear those pretty voices coming across the waters of the canals and then perhaps even the Adriatic. 
Now this is an aerial view of what I believe to be one of the most fascinating churches in all the world. This is the Cathedral of St. Mark. And I want to just point out a couple of things. Notice there the onion-shaped domes. Anytime you see a dome like that, you know that you're seeing the result of the influence of ancient Byzantium. That's Byzantine in architecture, and today, of course, we call that area Turkey. <clears throat> but this church was built to be a special uh, place of interment, a special place of burial for St. Mark. And here is the history behind it. While the Doge family was having the cathedral completed, they sent an armada of ships from here, Venice, over to Alexandria on the north of the continent of Africa, on the north of Egypt for that matter, and there Mark had died on a mission journey. You see, in the early centuries, first, second, third, Alexandria was a Christian outpost, and many an apostle went out from there to other places in the world. They'd catch the ship in Alexandria and go elsewhere to share the love of Jesus. And Mark was there when he died, and in a quiet little place he was buried. Over the centuries, Islam replaced Christianity. While once it was a great Christian center, it is today and has been now for hundreds of years a very strong center of the faith of Islam. And consequently, the tomb of Mark the Evangelist went unnoticed and, and the grounds went into disrepair and largely the place was ignored. And the Doge family, with strong feelings about that neglect, decided they would exhume his remains and have them brought over to Venice and interred beneath the high altar inside this cathedral. And so when the cathedral was near completion, they sent some ships and some sailors from Venice over to Alexandria to exhume the remains of Mark. And they went first to the city fathers. And they asked the city fathers, would it be all right if we exhumed Mark's remains and took him to Venice to bury him in a sacred place? And without thinking, really, the father said, no, no way. And the sailors pled the case of um, the Doge family and the idea behind it you folks are followers of Islam. There are hardly any Christians within miles of here, and we'd like to give them a sacred Christian place of burial. Why not? And the city father said, look, this is where he died. This is where he's buried. This is where history knows about him, and this is where he's going to stay. Well, without arguing, the sailors went back to their ships, but they didn't immediately leave. A couple of nights later, under the cover of darkness, a sky with no moon, they went to the grave of Mark with their shovels and their spades, and they exhumed his remains and wrapped them in burlap and headed back for their boat. And about daylight, they were stopped by the local constabulary. The policeman stopped them and said, what do you have there? What are you taking aboard your boat? And the sailor said, we're ready to go back now to Venice. We're ready to take the bad news back to the Doge leadership. But before we left, we thought we would take some, some protein to eat on the way. And so we have been out to a farmer just outside of town, and he butchered a couple of hogs for us, and we've wrapped them in this burlap. Would you like to see our pork? And the leaders of Islam and, and the jurisdiction, they said, we don't even want to hear about pork. You go ahead and get on your boat. And in that way, history says, they brought Mark back and buried him on the inside. And so in just a moment, we're going to go inside. But before we do that, I wanted you to notice this. This is today the bell tower. The bells for the cathedral are up in there, and every hour on the hour they ring them. You, by the way, can go up inside there and uh, climb stairs, get up in there, and walk in and around amongst the bells. But from experience, I can tell you this. You don't want to be on there when the clock strikes the hour because your ears are going to ring for a good long while. I could give several tourist tips, but let that be one to you. It originally, this tower, was a lookout for the sailors. And always there were the lookouts, two or three, that were watching the canals and watching the Adriatic to see if a ship be friend or foe. And if they didn't know who it was, then they would send out the warships. 
Now, before we go inside St. Mark's Cathedral, I want you to notice the beauty of the exterior of the architecture. Those statues that we're looking at on the spires are standing about 22 feet high from their base, and they're made of pure Carrera marble. And this was done a 1,000 years ago, folks, long before power tools, long before pneumatic tools. It was done by men with hammers and chisels in their hands. And I suggest to you, they did a really good job. What do you think? Yeah, they did a good job. All right? There is that bell tower that we spoke about a bit ago. And up inside there, the sailors watched. And, and th that original tower, though, I should tell you, fell down. It, it literally collapsed. And, and this one uh, is from more modern times. Not in just the last few years, but uh, from what we would call historically modern times. Now we're going to go through the entry door inside and there at the altar we have at the base the tomb of Mark. Mark was not one of the twelve disciples and this is a strange idea and I'll just share this with you quickly because you may find it of interest and it'll help you in your Bible study. You cannot study carefully the Gospels without recognizing almost immediately that the leader of the disciples was Peter. When there was a question asked, Peter gave the answer. When there was an action to be taken, whether it was jumping out of the boat or whipping out a sword, Peter takes the action. Peter, indeed, was the leader of the disciples. We have the Gospel according to John. We have the Gospel of Luke. And we have the Gospel of Matthew, but no Gospel of Peter when he was the leader? Strange. No, on the other hand, we do. Well, you see, Mark was a traveling companion of Peter. When Peter would go out an, as an apostle and preach, Mark would write down his sermons. So therefore then, when we're reading the Gospel of Mark, we're in reality reading the Gospel according to Peter. Now we're going to move again and go out the rear exit, and as we do, we notice the beauty of the interior of the domes. They have mosaic stories and art stories, Bible stories, and these built during the Dark Ages when folks couldn't read or write were beautifully decorated with Bible art, and the leaders of the church would take the folks around and show them the art and tell them the Bible story that went with them and educate them in that way. Now we're going to go around by boat to the Doge Chapel. On weekends, they worshipped in the Cathedral of Mark, but during the week, morning and evening, those who wanted, and most did, worshipped inside the chapel. And I want you to go with me up those marble steps, past those statues of Neptune, God of the sea, and we'll go right through this door into what I believe to be one of the most beautiful rooms in all the world. Some of the most gorgeous parquet hardwood flooring is to be found in that floor. And over the centuries, it's been beautifully kept and redone and redone. And then you'll notice up in the ceiling, the hardwood has been hand-carved, delicately carved, and then covered over with gold leaf. That is not spray paint. That's the real thing. But my reason for wanting you to come inside with me tonight was to show you this painting that decorates the front of the chapel. We're going to move in for a little bit of a close-up. And what do we have? We have our Lord Jesus seated on the throne, coming back from heaven on a rescue mission, coming on clouds, and every eye shall see him. And he said, when I come, I'll come with the glory of all of my angels. There they are on the clouds, all of the holy angels. And he said, I'll come with the glory of my Father. There is the pain, in the painting is the Holy Father coming to rescue the children. And this is what thrilled me so. Even during the darkest of ages, ladies and gentlemen, during the darkest of ages, at a time when Bibles were extinct, people were disallowed to read them, and, and the Bibles that were around were literally chained to monastery desks and were for the private interpretation of the pastors only. During the darkest ages, the church never completely lost sight of the beautiful teaching of the second coming of Jesus. And I hope that we are emphasizing it uh, to our benefit each evening, at least as we conclude, and, and lifting up Jesus and that your heart like mine will long to see him face to face. He is 
coming again. Thank you for traveling with me. As I travel the major cities of the United States and others of the world for that matter, and am introduced as a native of Idaho, I often become the brunt of Idaho jokes. I'll share one or two of them with you folks. What's the difference, I've been asked in Idaho, between a tornado and a divorce? Oh, I don't know. Well, either way, someone's going to lose a trailer house. <laughs> How do you know when you're in Idaho? Well, if your wealthiest relative invites you over for housewarming, and before you leave, they ask you to help take the tires off the house, you're probably in Idaho. If you're mowing, the decide finally you're going to mow the front lawn, and you find there a 1960 Plymouth Valiant, you're probably in Idaho. Now, I'm not trying to be a stand-up comic, and those things sound to me like kind of remakes of Jeff Foxworthy, but in any event, my point is this. We folks who've lived in around Idaho, and perhaps some of you who are neighbors to us, have sort of looked, been, been looked down upon as hayseeds, like we've fallen off the turnip truck fairly recently, and that in Idaho, we have a lot of junk along the roadsides and, and a lot of old refrigerators in the backyard, and tragically, a lot of that is true, tragically. I used to often drive, I'm now more often fly, but when I would drive uh, from the east to the west or, or go from Oregon or Washington into Idaho, it seemed I could almost tell when I had crossed the border because there was a lot of trash along the highway and there were a lot of trashy old places and a lot of junk parked around, uh, you know, spare parts. I confronted one Idahoan about it, and I said, you know, we could clean up a little around here. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, I just, uh, I just got religion. He said, I, uh, I just born again, and I don't believe in righteous by works. Yeah. Our Lord Jesus told a story, a parable that he called the parable of the steward. And in that parable, he made abundantly clear to us that this world does not belong to us. My backyard is not mine to trash. The highways upon which I drive are not mine to throw my garbage upon, but rather I am to be the caretaker. I am to watch over his world, and I'm to take very good care of it. And in his word, he has warnings for me if I choose to do otherwise. Now, I want to share with you very quickly something that I think is related. And before we concluded, I believe you'll agree with me. On Fox News this evening, there was the report that fuel prices across the United States in the last 10 days have risen as much as 20 cents. Now, that's not news to you especially the price of diesel. You farmers know what's been going on. Even that red stuff has gone out of sight in cost. And they went on to say that farming and manufacturing and, and delivery by rail and by truck are all affected and that at the grocery store, whether we're going to get Cheerios or, or a head of lettuce, we're going to pay more money. And then they gave some illustrations. They said that in the last 10 months, in the major grocery chains in the United States, a loaf of bread has increased in price 35%. And that during the same last 10 months, the price of a gallon of milk has gone up 40%. And it's largely due to the great increase in the cost of fuel. Now, George Will, in last week's Newsweek magazine, did a little bit of a commentary yeah, on his page, The Last Word. And I'm not going to read to you from that tonight because I have much other to read. And by the way, when tonight I read perhaps more than usual, it's because I want to share original sources. I think it's not fair for Lyle to stand up here and sort of set up straw men and leave folks with the idea that maybe he made that up. Where's the background? Where is the origin for that resource? I further want to go on record at the outset tonight by saying that I am not some kind of a fanatic. I am not a Greenpeace nut. I am not a tree hugger. I am an old logger. And I'll go at the same time on record to say to you that I have always strongly been against clear-cut logging, and I'm against the slaughter of the what's left of our old-growth forests. Okay? 
So you know where I stand on some of these issues. But in any event, George Will says that the American people, it seems obvious, have decided to avoid drilling up in the Alaskan area where we could get enough oil to provide our needs for at least several years. We have chosen instead to destroy the forests of the earth and create all kinds of greenhouse gases and to grow a lot of corn and soybeans and try to make fuel out of that. And he said, it's going to cost us more in the diesel for the tractors to grow the soybeans than it is if we would do some exploration offshore or maybe up in Alaska. And so the point that I want to make at this juncture is that we're caught in a catch-22. We really are. We're in that proverbial vicious cycle. Now, I'd like you, ladies and gentlemen, if you will, please, to open your Bibles to our first scripture, Revelation chapter 11. We've said over and over again that the book of Revelation is for those who live in the last days. It's not the last book by accident, but by God's design. It's information for those who live in the very last days. And I also, while we're turning to Revelation 11, want to say once more that prophecy is history written in advance. It's God's pulling aside the curtain that veils the future and giving us insights as to what the future holds in order that we might get ready, make preparation spiritual most of all. On the other hand, history is the mere reflection of prophecy. It is prophecy fulfilled, and prophecy and history go together like identical twins. Now, we're ready then to read from Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, and I'm going to read at verse 18. The nations were angry. Your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. And you're going to reward those, your servants, and the prophets, and your saints, and those that have done work in your name, both small and great. And you're going to destroy those who, there it is. Did you know that the Bible was filled with warning about destroying our planet? God says that in the end time, I'm going to have to destroy the folks that willingly and flagrantly and purposefully destroy the earth. Those who pollute and know they're polluting are going to come to a sad end. In the beginning, ladies and gentlemen, we lived, our parents, I should better say, lived in a perfect world. And the record of Genesis is abundantly clear. God in the center of the universe placed planet Earth. In the center of planet Earth, he placed a beautiful garden. In the center of the garden, he placed our parents, Adam and Eve. My daughter called me from the big island of Hawaii yesterday. She said, Dad, you won't believe where we are. She said, we're in a botanical garden. We're in a natural garden alongside the sea. And she said, they're the most lovely plants and flowers. In fact, she said, I and the grandkids were just saying a bit ago, it reminds us of the Garden of Eden. It must have been much like this. It was indeed beautiful. More beautiful, I'm sure, than anything we've ever imagined. And so God said to our parents, Adam and Eve, live here. Make this your home. Train the vines. Name the animals. Raise your kids. I'll stop by in the evening time to visit with you. And then, as you read on, you find God giving instruction. And let's go there to read, shall we? We ought to do that together. It's one thing for Lyle to say it. It's something else again for us to read it from our Bibles. Genesis chapter 1, beginning with verse 27. Here was God's instruction to the family. Shortly after, he'd placed them inside the garden. Genesis chapter 1, beginning to read at verse 27. God created them in his image, in the image of God he created them. Male and female, he created them both. And then God blessed them, and he said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. Subdue it, and have dominion over the fish in the sea, and over the fowls of the air, and every moving living thing. This is your home. You're in charge of it all. Take care of it. And then you continue your study in the book of Genesis, and you come over to chapter 7, and we don't have time to turn and read. Chapter 7 and 8, of course, the story of the great flood and of the great destruction that would come. 
men had become so sinful and, and so belligerent against God's truths that God said, I'm going to have to destroy the thing. Noah, you better build a big boat. And he did. And then the floodwaters came and the earth was drastically changed. And from that point on, we Christians believe in what we call catastrophism. Some folks look at the age of the earth through the eyes of the evolutionists and they see millions and millions and millions of years. Other folks, Christians in particular, look at the earth through God's eyes and from the vantage point of God's word and we see a catastrophe that changed the earth instantly and suddenly and did not require millions of millions of years but only just a few thousand years. I remember so very well and not so very long ago uh, a man who was leading a group of tourists down into the bottom of the Grand Canyon. They were riding on the backs of mules and they would go a ways and down a few switchbacks and then they would dismount and the guide would point out various strata and various ideas and then he looked down into the bottom of the canyon, pointed out the little narrow ribbon of water that was the Colorado River. And he said, now look at the river and then slowly raise your eyes and look up to the rim of the canyon and imagine how many millions and millions and millions of years it took that tiny little bit of water to carve this massive canyon. And folks' jaws dropped. <gasps> yeah, they said they'd heard a scientific fact. And a little bit later... The guide stopped the group and he made this remark, those of us who have spent a lifetime studying the canyon and its environment have seen the mud of the canyon turn into stone. Now he didn't seem to catch it, but he'd raised the question, did the Colorado River carve that massive canyon out of stone or out of mud? I was a student at Walla Walla College when there came a break in an irrigation ditch out in the countryside east, and by the next morning, there was a washout in the sand hills that you could park, uh, I, I don't know, 50 or 60 big trucks in, and it happened just like that. And so there are several ways to look at the world and its origin, its beginnings, and no matter how you look at it, it requires faith. Now, we want to read together from Genesis chapter 9 because this is God's instruction now after the flood and we're going to begin at the very first verse, Genesis chapter 9. Genesis 9 and reading forward. God blessed Noah and also his sons and he said unto them, be fruitful now and multiply and replenish the earth. And so man did a really good job of replenishing the earth. And I want to just share with you now the facts in regard to the growth of the population on planet earth. Scientists who mathematically study these kinds of events say with some certainty that before there were ever a first billion people here who'd lived on planet earth, it took 5,000 years. Do you have that now? You A students are going to want to write it down. It took 5,000 years to produce the first billion people here on planet earth. The third billion, I'm sorry, the second billion took only 100 years. Now look at that leap from 5,000 years to 100 years for the second billion. The third billion took only 35 years. The fourth billion took five years. And the fifth billion took only two years at the present rate of growth around the world by the year 2020, there shall be 16 to 18 billion of us, more than we can possibly feed and clothe. And that is from, that is a fact, a statement from the scientists, not from Lyle's library. Mike Wallace from 60 Minutes Magazine made this report recently, and I jotted it down. He said, today around the world, there are 1 million new people every 48 hours. A million folks, new babies every 48 hours. A few years ago, a group of scientists formed a, a think tank. They, they formed a study group to try to look at the problems of pollution, population, explosion, and, and the feeding of humanity and, and what the future might hold. And they gave themselves the title, the Club of Rome, because that was sort of a central meeting place, it had nothing to do with religion or church. The Club of Rome. And I want to read to you a little bit of what they have said. They were formed in 1968. They're made up of economists, humanists, civil servants, and um, governors and so forth. Now listen, we members are united by an overriding conviction that the earth's major problems are so complex that traditional policies are not going to be able long to cope. The trouble, in big caps now, 
We are in deep trouble, big trouble. Massachusetts Institute of Technology recently presented this fact. They said, the present model that we now study of interaction between the population and its relationship to agriculture, industrial production, natural resources, and environmental uh, health and degradation is frightening. Now, these are scientists. These are not preachers. These are not maniacs who've escaped from a loony bin somewhere. These are the scientists. You know, if a few years ago a preacher said something like this, he'd be immediately tagged as some kind of a weirdo from a storefront church on, down on Maine, you know? But no longer. Now the scientists are saying it, and the men who spent years and years and years studying it. And then they go on from the Club of Rome to spell down some of the problems. Number one, too many children. Too many children. Number two, agricultural burning. Number three, overpopulation. Over, I'm sorry, overconsumption. And number four, improper waste disposal of our household, our kitchen garbage. And number four, number five rather, improper human waste disposal. And uh, that includes the sewer. And then number five, six, uh, pesticides and overcrowding. And finally, economic dependence upon growth. And what they're saying is that the economies of the industrialized world depend upon a superabundance of people. We must have more people so we can have more refrigerators and vice versa, you see. More people so we can sell more automobiles and vice versa. And so we're caught in that catch-22 once again. And it's out of hand, say the leaders of the world who study this thing. Now listen to me. I began to speak to you about 11 minutes ago. There's the clock. About 11 min minutes ago, I began to talk to you. Ten minutes ago, I'm, since in the last ten minutes, I should better say, there have been 565 people born. Three per second. In the last 10 minutes, 58 have died from hunger, from starvation. In the last 10 minutes, 327 acres of wild lands have been lost. 1.7 acres per second. In the last 10 minutes, 140,893 metric tons of carbon dioxide have been released up into the atmosphere. That's 70.8 tons, I'm sorry, 708 tons per second. Ten minutes ago, one, since the last ten minutes, 148,853 metric tons of topsoil have been lost by erosion. That is 747 and a half tons per second. Thousands and thousands of acres of farmland in the last short while have been concreted over. Have you folks noticed that in your area? Well, let me tell you a little bit about what has happened in my hometown. And I say that uh, kind of loosely because I haven't lived there for a while. But I refer often to Boise, Idaho as my hometown. Born uh, nearby and raised nearby and lived in the city itself for several years. Boise took an explosion, a growth spurt, a few years ago that has continued and increased at a phenomenal rate. They're so far behind now in their infrastructure, in their roads and sewers and streets and sidewalks and schools that they don't know if they'll ever catch up. Now, the Treasure Valley, which extends from Ontario, Oregon, out to near Mountain Home, Idaho, is one of the most fertile valleys in all of this world. I mean, you put something, a seed in the ground, you give it a little water, and it's going to grow, and grow very, very well. And you folks have some similar soils around here. It's volcanic and alluvial, and it's great and really very good. About four years ago, the city of Boise surpassed Spokane, Washington. Spokane had been the third largest city in the Pacific Northwest. There was Seattle, there was Portland, and then there was Spokane. But four years ago, Boise surpassed Spokane, became the third largest. Eighteen months ago, Boise surpassed, Olymp uh, surpassed Olympia, Washington, and now it is Seattle and Portland and then Boise, third largest city. And they have poured concrete and pavement over the most fertile soil that I have ever known in my lifetime. And I wonder now, when I drive through the Treasure Valley, where in the world are we going to get our spuds? 
And when you look at this whole situation from the par farmer's point of view, you have to be sympathetic. You know, they've struggled and struggled and struggled and worked and worked, and often they've gone behind for that year, and they, they wonder how they're going to buy the fuel and the fertilizer for next year, and then someone comes along and offers them millions and millions of dollars for those few acres. You can't blame them for selling out. I read, by the way, about a farmer in Iowa who'd won several million dollars at the lottery, and the reporters went to him, as reporters often do when such good news comes to a community, and they asked him, what do you plan to do with all that money? And the guy said, well, I guess I'll just keep farming until it's all gone. <laughs> Scientists from the Central Institute of New Zealand say that the present global population of 6 billion is 30% more than the Earth's biological capacity to sustain the sta present standard of living. Growth may not even be able to be stabilized. It's projected to be 10 million in a few short years. There are 51 billion hectares of Earth's surface, but only 13 billion of these are arable and suitable to, for farming. 3.3 billion are used as pasture land to feed cattle. The world needs immediately to reduce its uh, carbon dioxide emissions by at least half. The United Nations recognized this desperation, and they put out the warnings. But few, it seems, at least in the third world, are paying any attention. And then they go on to say that the industrialized nations, you know, and that includes us, we're right at the top of the list, are the biggest polluters. You see again the conundrum, the catch-22. And when, when a country becomes industrialized, such as now is happening in China and out in India, they pump out more and more and more pollution. And the problem increases, drastically increases. I want to read you again from the scientists of the Club of Rome, only just very briefly. I'm going to read it. Changing weather, weather patterns are reducing permanently the amount of arable land, and a growing population is simultaneously demanding more food. Water is essential for the supply of both domestic and agriculture, uh, 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 domestic use and agriculture purposes, and is becoming critical in so very many countries. Some states are looking for desalinization as the solution. But this, is the, this means pumping water over long, long distances, which demands more electrical power. With our growing population, there's an increasing problem of pollution in our drinking water sources. Much power is generated from oil and natural gas. New reserves will continue to be discovered, but recent detailed reports suggest that we now use one barrel of oil. We now find, I'm sorry, we now find one new barrel of oil for every four that we consume. Amazing. Amazing. In spite of our best, the best efforts of technology, we have no alternatives for oil and gas. Technology cannot replace limited resources. I told you folks, I think a night or two ago, but just during the announcement period, that while I was in Phoenix, Arizona, there came the announcement that over in Los Angeles that day, they began to drink for the first time the water that had been in their toilets three days before. And they say the water is pure and as pure as that that is coming down from the Shasta Mountain snow melt, pure water. Uh, some were shocked at that, but it's been happening in around Denver, Colorado for years and years and years. And when I moved to the Denver area to work, I w it was suggested to me by some of the folks that I might take my cup of drinking water and hold it up to the light and then decide whether or not I was really all that thirsty. Here's one again. Here's one for you. And this comes from the scholars over in France. The global economy is using natural resources faster than they can be renewed. This from Lester Brown of the Washington-based Earth Policy Institute. We're releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere faster than the Earth can begin to absorb it. Our economy is based upon cutting trees faster than they can grow, over-pumping aquifers and draining rivers. Soil erosion of our croplands exceeds new soil formation. We're taking fish from the, from the oceans faster than they can reproduce. We're creating an economy whose output is inflated by drawing down the Earth's national capital. The challenge is to deflate the global economic bubble before it bursts with an effect 
to the entire world. To avoid this, action has to be taken to reduce water consumption to a sustainable level, to address the population of the world to a point of stability, particularly in the developing countries, as well as stabilizing emissions. Avoiding the effects of higher temperatures on crop yields means quickly stabilizing the climate by cutting global carbon emissions in half by at least 2015. But those who are in the know say that is quite, quite impossible. Bad news, huh? Someone said bad news travels like wildfire, while good news travels slow. But there is good news, ladies and gentlemen. There is good news. One day our Lord himself is going to come and purify this earth. One day Jesus is going to come riding down the skies, and he's going to bring an end to all of these things that we have brought upon ourselves or the devil has been in partnership in bringing upon us. I want to allude quickly to a book now. Some of you may want to go and buy it. It's entitled Ten Billion Mouths to Feed, and the author is David Pimentel. Listen to him. What will the world do for fertility when petroleum is gone? What will happen to people's crops when the overpumped aquifers deplete? Hydrologists say we're running out of water. The chemists say we're running out of air. The botanist says we're running out of food. But Lyle says, the Bible says, we're running out of time. We're out of time. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, while we're gathered here, eight million in the third world are starving to death. Eight million. The warehouser company for whom I worked at a time began on the East Coast. And with their hand saws, they chopped their way through the Eastern forests in a couple of generations. And then they moved to the heartland, to Wisconsin and Minnesota. And it was said when they moved there, there was timber enough to last forever. But within 25 years, they had cut the majority of the forests of mid-America. And then they moved to the Pacific Northwest. And when they saw the old growth in the virgin forest of the Pacific Northwest, the warehouser company said, we have timber enough to last now indeed forever and ever. We shall never be able to get ahead of the growth. Well, you and I know better. We know better. And I appreciate the timber companies and Weyerhaeuser and Boise Cascade and others that are replanting and that kind of thing. But you know, folks, we're really not keeping up. We're not keeping up. We're not getting ahead. We're continuing to destroy our forests, forests that take a lot of pollution out of the sky and make our air so much better to breathe. In Isaiah chapter 51, verse 6, God described what would happen to this world before Jesus comes back. He said, this earth is going to wax old like a, like a garment, like your clothes wear out when they get old and tired. And then in Joel chapter 1, verse 17, there God through the prophet Joel said that in the last days, the seed would rot under the clod. And that's happening all around the world. The Gobi deserts and the other, the African deserts and some of the South American deserts are growing by acres, multiplied acres, every single day. The deserts are moving on a march northward, northward still. I suggest to us tonight that instead of putting our minds totally upon solutions, and there is much we can do about it, don't get me wrong, and there is much we must do about it because we are stewards now. But instead of setting our hearts on this world and, and putting our hopes in a fix, I suggest that we place our minds and hearts like Abraham did on the next world. Because the Apostle Paul, as he sat in jail and wrote his last lesson, would say, I look for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. This preacher tonight wants to say to you, I believe it's our only hope. He must come again, and indeed, he's going to do that. Get our priorities in order. The ostrich syndrome is not going to work for us. We began our first night with a story of a lady who near her death called in the pastor and gave instructions for her funeral. You remember it? How many of you were here? That was the first night. You remember? Yes. And she said, Pastor, I don't want to be in my casket with my hands over my chest and folded together. No, I want my hands to be by my side, and in my left, 
I want my Bible, and in my right hand, I want a fork. And the preacher's jaw dropped. He said, to, well, what do you mean? What's with the fork? She said, Pastor, I always really get encouraged when at the end of the fellowship dinners at church, those who come by to clear the table say to me, keep your fork. Keep your fork. Because then I know that something better is coming. So to each of you tonight again, this preacher would say, keep your fork. Keep your fork. In Psalm 37, verse 25, there God said through David, I've never seen God's children going hungry or begging bread. Things are going to get better. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life and that more abundantly. So keep your fork. In Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 5, God said, I'm going to take you to a land flowing with milk and honey. Keep your forks now. In Isaiah 65, Isaiah 65, 21 and 22, God said, and the earth made new, you're going to plant vineyards and grow wonderful gardens. In Revelation 22, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, God says, I'm going to take you to a place that I have remade, and you're going to eat from the fruit of the tree of life. And then you move through your Bibles to the last three chapters of the book of Revelation, and what do you find? You find the earth restored. You find in the center of this restored, remade earth, the Garden of Eden, beautiful as ever it was, even perhaps more lovely. In the center of the garden is the tree of life. And where in Genesis the folks were forbidden to eat from the tree, and a flaming, sordid angel stood in front to guard it, it says in the Revelation that we shall eat regularly from the tree, and its fruit is for the healing of the nations. You see, my dears, everything lost in the first three chapters of Genesis because of sin is restored in the last three of Revelation because of grace. And it's not an accident. Because in every passage, in every chapter, every book between, you find God running around and begging through His Son and through His prophets, accept me, let me be your Lord. We thank you, dear Lord, for your promise. Our hearts could be worried, upset. We could develop diseases, high blood pressure, hypertension, ulcers. As we look at the things that have come upon the earth, you predicted that in the end time, men's hearts would fail them for fear. But then we see and read your promise. I will come again. I'll restore everything even better than it was to begin with. Thank you, dear Lord Jesus. Thank you for your love. Thank you that you become the hound of heaven. You go into the cities, into the skyscrapers, looking for your children and calling them out. You go into the mountains and into the woods and into the wildernesses, seeking your own, calling them, come to me. I want to restore to you the best of everything. Thank you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.